right, man. We're here on a Thursday afternoon. LK, Larry, um, saving the world. You're taking a break, I guess, and we're going to talk <laughs> a little bit today. And, and I know I did a little research on this that uh, the series. It's pretty interesting. I don't know how many people are aware of this. Could, can you tell me a little bit about this four days to save the world? So the four days to save the world evolved from another um, attempt at doing this called the social movement, which was two years ago in Montreal. That one had four teams. Um, you know, the producer was working through figuring out how to do it. And um, he'll be the first to say, hey, you know, we didn't have enough com cameras rolling. So they were going to do reshoots. Well, this little thing called COVID happened. Oh, yeah. And I heard about Canada that. got shut down. And a bunch of people couldn't travel anywhere. And they kept trying to reschedule, trying to reschedule. And it just never really happened. And you couldn't do the reshoots. So pivot, right? The guy's smart, pivots. And says, you know what? We're going to do this, but we're going to do it bigger and better. So okay. instead of four teams, we're going to have 10 teams. And we're going to bring in really strong people have tons of cameras, better setups, and really make this something special. So the concept is really simple. You take CEOs and leaders from all over the world, strangers, and put them on teams to solve a global problem. So my team was empower, empowering women, right? Okay. Another one had, you know, solve homelessness. There was, you know, solve hunger, you know, all these different things, uh, solve bullying, truly, amazing solutions come out of this. And the idea is that these teams create these solutions that actually can become a business that does what they say they're going to do. And uh, I'll say our team uh, definitely leaned into that and uh, it's going to be interesting. I think we're going to have a company come out of it. Really? Yep. Really? So it, now it wrapped, I guess it was a, was it a two year run? Is that right? Or is well, it so no, it, so no, the first, so the, like I said, the first season, they didn't get enough footage. So that one's not really going to happen. I don't think, I think that will okay. be, he'll figure out some way to use it in the context of what's going on. But the first true season will be uh, labor day this year. And I think it's going to be on Apple, awesome. Apple TV and Amazon. And I can't remember the other, you know, channels it's going to go on. Do you worry about paparazzi? <laughs> you know, constantly. <laughs> I mean, constantly. that's probably an issue with you now already. So this is just going <laughs> to put a little bit more. Uh, and you're on a team. I mean, were you guys, how long did you guys spend together? Uh, like four days. In a house team? Really? Well, five days. Five days. Well, we were all at um, a, a resort. And so it was interesting because you very spent very little time doing anything resorty. It was mainly getting on these, you know, sleeping there, getting on these, you know, getting makeup and everything done and then jumping off onto a shuttle bus and going to these um, sites where they would have different things going on with the teams and um, solving the problems. Right. So you have, to, you know, it's teams like strangers. So you gotta, you know, do the classic storm form norm. And what's really cool about it is all the people dropping their egos. And there are some really, really successful people on these teams and watching them just lean into a cause, which is, you know, one of the tenants that I try and get my CEO clients, uh, how I want them to be as leaders. You know, it's, if you kind of go by the uh, Jim Collins thing, level four, level five, you know, if level four is a leader and, you know, the definition of leadership is the art of getting people to do what needs to be done, right? Right. right to do. And it's want to do it, not just do it, but want to do it. Well, level five is getting people to want to do what must be done without me putting my ego in the way from a humble point of view where it's never about me. It's always about our cause. So I constantly ask my CEOs, you know, what's your cause? What's your cause? And what was great about this is really fast. Everybody leans into the cause, drops the egos, drops the pretense gets vulnerable, shares their journeys, you know, give, gives their why they're there, right? And here's why I'm here, which is another big thing I try and get my CEOs to understand. And I have a champion model. I call it the organizational champion model. So unlike Simon Sinek, I actually believe you can win at business. I think people win right. every day at business, right? I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know what the infinite game is, right? I, okay. So good luck, Simon. I'm trying to help people win every day, every week, every month, every quarter, every year. That's what it's about. And it's about the cause, not about them. 
So you get into this room and you said there was 10 teams at about, were there four people per team? Is that uh, right? No, no. Each team had 11 people. Oh my Lord. Okay. So there's, there's <laughs> yeah. a, that's a feat in itself. How do you get 11 people, high powered, um, successful people to, I mean, you said everybody dropped their ego, but there's still a lot of brain power, firepower in a room. How do you get the so, storm, storm norm thing going? So it's classic leadership one-on-one, right? It, it, everybody has to understand what their role is. And one of the things we do right away is we talk as a team. Okay. What, what's my superpower, right? What am I great at? You know, am I great at the spreadsheets? Am I a numbers person? Am I a marketing person? Am I an operations person? What, what, what's my talent that I can bring to the table? And we literally divide it up into mini teams to then work on different components of the cause. And again, it translates right to do what I do for a living. One of the things I've talked about with my CEOs is, have you developed a team underneath you that supplements your weaknesses? And right. do they all leverage each other? Do they all blend together? And did you ever watch the uh, last dance, the Michael yeah. Jordan? All right. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, of course I did. Yes, I forgot that's what it was called, yes. So what was great about the Jordan teams is people playing roles, you know, this person's the passer, this person's the defender, you know, Rodman, I mean, could Rodman do, he could defend and rebound. And he embraced that role. And also in the leadership in the soft skills of that team, Jordan was the pusher in your face. Let's get better challenge you. You know, my favorite quote in that whole thing is Jordan tearing up when he sees, you know, how rough he was on people. And he goes, winning has a price. Leadership has a price. He's that guy that says, let's take the hill. Now you look at Bill Cartwright, you know, yeah. here's a center who can barely run, but what's his role in the team? Okay. So in those days, you know, he had to protect Michael Jordan because they played rough back then. So he's a little bit of an enforcer him, you know, he, he, he played that role, but he also was the peacemaker. He was the softer leader. So when Jordan ran someone's, you know, face into the ground, he was the one that lifted them up and said, Hey, it's okay. Pat him on the back. We're going to be fine. Well, they had, you know, that, what a run that team had. But, you know, they had years to develop that. You guys had four days. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that that's it's still a pretty noble feat. And, and I understand that, you know, your your business, which you know, I do want to talk about a little bit because you're, you're coaching CEOs and you're, you've mentioned several times already your CEO clients. They uh, do CEOs. I mean, you think they're aware of their blind spots and where they need development? Ooh, so that's a bell curve, right? Yeah. So I'd say most of them do. The extent to which they're willing to admit how many blind spots they have is up for debate. But most of them know they, they, they want to work on it. It's interesting. I think sometimes CEOs get this bad rap. You know that oh they're all about them and you know their egos are so big and you know i find the exact opposite most of the ceos i know lean into being humble they lean into how great my team is uh, they're truly about the cause and and there's a little bit of a uh you know maybe it's a, a spoiler right because if someone's really willing to work with me they've already they've already Raised, raised their hand and said, yo, I, I know I need some stuff. I need to work on some stuff. I mean, I don't get, I don't get the person that says I'm great. You know, I don't get the lone wolf guy that, you know, I'm the smartest guy in the room and I've never heard anybody tell me something I didn't already know. And I've met those people. Oh yeah. I, I screen them out. Like they're, they're really easy to screen out. And I just tell them, look, yeah, you know, I can't help you. You know, everybody's not for me and I'm not for everybody. And those yeah. people are not for me. Well, so, cause I know a lot of times we've done this process recently, the old 360 assessment and, oh, sure. you know, our CEO was, uh, was aware enough to participate in it and he wanted to be the first one who had the process to kind of set the tone. And I mean, there are very, I found this with him and with just about everybody, this was a senior leadership exercise. There were very few surprises for these people. Right. Right. We know, we know kind of, and some of it is like you said, well, they admit it. And the other part is, do they care? Yeah. Or is that just part of how I, I am? And that's what it takes to get things done. So a little bit of that. So I, I use a phrase called, are you a big J or little J big jerk, little jerk. 
you, you, you do have to have a little J in you yeah. to rise up through the ranks and get to that level. You know, you do have to have a little bit of toughness. You do have to give people some radical candor and ask them to level themselves up. <laughs> Probably be sometimes a little harsh, sometimes be a little self-serving. It, it's part of the journey. What I think it, that happens though, is during that journey, people learn lessons. The smart people learn lessons. You know, and you look at, you know, what makes someone a great leader? You know, obviously you gotta be pretty smart. I, I don't think you have to be the smartest guy, by the way. Oftentimes research has shown it's not the really, really smart people that lead people. Uh, it's usually pretty smart, right? And they really have IEQ, you know, yeah. their, their self-awareness, their ability yeah. to read the room, their ability to take their own medicine and, and be self-governing. You know, that self-discipline that Want, gets people to want to follow them. That's a that's a gift. A lot of a lot of that. Some of that you can't. Well, you you'll disagree because you're helping them do this. But it seems, <laughs> yeah, you know, a lot of that it's very hard to come by if it's not something that you've you've got in your your DNA. But so let me ask you this: sort of random question. If you're sure. you're a young executive, um, say you're in your 30s, you put in about 10 years, you're on the way up. What is it about being a CEO that you don't know yet? Ooh, that's a really good question. The pain. Ooh, see, people, see, yeah. people see the glory. People yeah. see this stuff. You know, the trappings, the stock options, the money, the this, the that, the how people, you know, kowtow to you, right? Like, sorry, my dog just decided to bark, of course. Um, how, how your life is sort of concierge kind of style life. What they don't see is the grind it took to get there. Mm. What they don't see is the loneliness of staring at the ceiling at 2 a.m. and actually worrying about the fact that people's lives are impacted by what you're going to decide the next day. Yeah. You know, it's, it's so timely. And the, the reason I asked you that, too, is, you know, the, the man I work for, CEO, he is probably not probably he is the most passionate guy in the building about the business there's no there's no close second mm -hmm. and he does i mean he keeps a pad by his bed for those 3 a.m wake-ups yeah. he has his list and and i don't think a lot of guys a lot of guys a lot of people really necessarily appreciate the focal you know the focus the heat that ceos under i mean they still answer to a board you know <laughs> they it's not like they have no boss right and what's what's even more pressure, like you said, they're it's from the ground up, the people they support. If you really have that heart where these are my this is my team, these are my people, you don't want them to fail. That's right. And that's a lot on your shoulders. That's right. And and you know, are they all perfectly flawed humans? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's a bell curve of egos and a bell curve of everything, right? Yet my experience is that most of them are really good humans and want to do the right thing and care passionately, passionately about their organization, the people in the organization. Yeah. It's like when you get to the point where you are comfortable enough to hire people smarter than you who can do things that maybe you can't do, but you're still, you know, you're able to kind of nudge them. Uh, you know, you, I've worked for CEOs at all levels of their own development too. It's kind of interesting. The ones yeah. that, you know, the bull that charges in versus the one that walks down and just says, Hey, I'm coming down the hill. I'm the bull. So let me ask you a question. I want to ask sure. you a question. So this is yeah. a, so this is a, my social experiment. Ooh, good. So I talk to CEOs all the time about how do they get there? What we're just talking about, how do they get to where they trust a team of people who can be smarter, better, you know, than they are. And it's, I think it's really hard for a lot of CEOs to move down that path. And what I try and paradigm it with them, I say, look, what it really amounts to, I'm sorry, I don't know what's going on outside, but the dog is not happy about it. Um, they only have four ways they can spend time in my book. You know, time's your only resource, right? So it's strategic relationships, strategic thinking, developing people and the day job. And, and my whole thing is your point, And I want to see if you agree when they learn how to get out of the day job, their percentage of time when that day job is 10% or 20%, 20% or less for sure, but hopefully more like 10%. That's when the magic starts to happen. 
Oh, I totally agree. And, and it's a, uh, it's a maturity level thing. I think part of it is that you're maybe once you get past the point of, I've still got to prove myself, you know, I, everybody's looking at me, I'm the guy, mm -hmm. you know, if uh, it takes a lot of self-confidence and a lot of, you know, inner peace. I mean, you got to have some harmony. But yeah. That's okay. I don't, I don't have to know everything. That's yeah. why I hired you. <laughs> that's why I hired you. <laughs> tell, tell me something I don't know. Cause this yeah. is, I'm, if, Kind of have that learning attitude all the time. You know, I think the hardest thing is for the person the CEO hires that is in the function the CEO came out of. If it, the CEO yes. from the C, a CFO job, I, I feel bad for the CFO. If it's a CMO, same thing. HR, same thing. You know, whatever function that CEO came out of, that's the tough role. Man, that's true. I hadn't even thought about that, but that's absolutely accurate because you're. That's the the bar they know more than any that you have yeah. to live up to. Yeah. Yep. Well, and you. Uh, your model, your business model, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but you said that, you know, you found that that peer peer group is the most effective path to accomplish this with CEOs. And I'll share why. So, you know, having been an employee, one in a business and built a business before, the good news is I can look them in the eye and say, hey, I've been that 3 a.m. staring at the ceiling guy. I, I've yeah. sweated. Well, will we make it even right in the beginning? Because it's a startup. What I find is they're going to ring me out of everything I can share with them and help them with in about a year or two. Okay. You know, I, I hope it's two years. Maybe it's more like six months. I don't know, but, but there's a, there's a bandwidth to how much I actually know and can share. Right. Sure. Now I'm not saying that coaching can't be helpful in other ways for over extended period of time. But what I will say is you will never ring out the bandwidth of 17 other CEOs sitting with you in a room once a month. And all you're doing is helping each other. That's facilitated. And the key here is facilitate. You know, I'm, I'm going to take a mini shot at YPO. The thing I don't like about YPO is there's no professional facilitator. So any group you're in, it, it's only as good as if someone's a good facilitator in that room. And you know, as well as I do, facilitating leaders is hard. It's yeah. not a natural skill. Most people don't have it. What's great about the Vistage model is facilitated peer group by someone who's actually been where you've been. And everybody's only agenda in that room is to challenge you in a good way. We call it care confrontation to help you level up and ask you great questions. So you can see all the perspectives about the decisions you make. That's the model. And it's, it's so simple and it's a high touch thing in a low touch world. Now, how did, how were you able to continue that, that high touch during COVID? Was it just using virtual technology? Ooh, we zoomed our butts off. Yeah. Right. But, Everybody knew eventually we had to get off of Zoom because this yeah. is not, this model doesn't have legs. Again, I would say this, you could do a Zoom peer group meeting thing and you, it's probably going to work for about a year, but eventually it just gets, you know, you just don't have that touch that it's the sidebars at the break. It's the little conversations at the desk when they, we're talking about a topic, you know, it's the humor you get, you know, that human interaction, and, you know, people, our pack animals, they need to be together. Oh man, we're, we're simpatico. I mean, and that's, I'm sure you hear this everywhere right now, people struggling with, all right, people, there, are, there is value to be in live at the workplace and exactly why you want them back. And can you put it in those type of terms that you just did? But I can tell you our leadership team at the company I'm, I'm with, we saw, you know, immediate results just going back once a, once a week where we could collaborate live. Yep. And, and it is, it's the, the hallway conversations and, Hey, let's all go to lunch that kind of, or let's bring it in and go to the boardroom and we'll all eat and keep going through some of this stuff. There's, it, there's no denying it. I mean, it's an yep. undeniable benefit. It's going to be a harder sell uh, to employees at large because there's still a lot of fear out there and whatnot. But yeah. I think for leaders, that's absolutely imperative. It's hard to lead from a, from a virtual environment. Well, and it's interesting because I, you know, one of the things I told my CEOs during the start of when, when COVID was a real thing, I'd say probably last March, April, when it really, you know, people are like, oh, darn, not this March, but a year ago. March, yeah. April. And I said, here's what's going to happen. And I used my little Marine Corps background. You're yeah. going to learn who the wartime generals are. Oh, There's man. peacetime generals. But what you're going to learn right now is who are your wartime generals? Those are the leaders you're going to want in the future. And I will also tell you, HR has never been more important. 
And I still, and I think actually right now, even more important to COVID, because really, as we know, COVID forced a lot of things to happen just because it had, that you had to, it was forced change. Right now, we're in a squishy time when making really good HR decisions is literally, I believe, going to make or break the future of some companies. So what I've been, again, coaching my CEOs on is, did your, was your HR leader a wartime general during COVID? Great. If, if that, if they didn't step up, you might want to swap them out because it's actually the next act is going to be yeah. more important than that first act. Uh, man, are we, are we like mind melding? <laughs> is that what's happening here? Because, you know, that was the big deal. Uh, my whole impetus for finally getting this podcast going too is it was a leadership moment for HR that that was, you know, never waste the opportunity to take a step up. That was it. Cause it yeah. was all on us and you're going to blow it if you think people are going to remember just that part, you're going to blow it if you don't do this next part right. Because it's that's the part where, you know, now people have been through this. Thank you so much for getting us through this. And you want us to do what now? That's right. where <laughs> right. that is. I had a uh, an old boss and he's a mentor, uh, Dr. Price Pritchett. He used to always say they don't award medals during times of peace. And that was basically what you're just saying, the wartime generals. That was absolutely an exercise in crisis management and, you know, leaders and HR people who got through it, you just got to tip your hat because that was, that was a rough, rough transition. Oh, I mean, it, and, and it's not over. And that's my no. point. The, the no. win hasn't happened yet. No, so you're right. The win will happen when they figure out that right balance of how much in person should we be and how much flexibility can we have? Because I do believe, you know, sorry, Jamie Dimon, I don't think people need to be in the office five days a week. No, I don't either. I do think it's somewhere in that three to two, more probably three than two, to be honest, until you've developed your culture and your team. So for new hires, I mean, think about this, how many thousands and thousands, well, millions of hires are out there that have never met their teammates in person. It's crazy. Hey man, I joined. I joined as the CH, uh, CHRO during the pandemic when everybody was remote, and I think the only two people I knew were my boss and uh, our executive assistant that was helping us out. Other than that, I'll meet people from time to time now that people are leaking back in the office, and you recognize mm -hmm. a voice or something, and you're like, "Oh my God, that's you! <laughs> hey, how you doing?" Yeah. yeah. No, it, it is. You mentioned it. We're humans have to. We have to have some sort of human interaction. It's got to be live. Yeah, um, I was I was having a discussion with one of our guests about the you know the Zoom calls and everything. I think are great if they're done correctly, but how many people won't turn on the camera? You know, they're they're muted, they're multitasking. You know, I'm guilty as anybody else. It's just it's not the same thing. Could you? I mean, you couldn't be in a meeting with your boss and just say, "Don't look at me," and I'm going to take notes and something else while you, while you're talking, because that's what Zoom kind of allows us to do. It really does. I will say that the other thing Zoom did on the positive side is it made people realize you can get things done a lot faster. You can. Yeah. I mean, Zoom, Zoom does make you focus. I think Zoom make because you just want to get it done. Let me ask you this. You work with all these, you work with CEOs, you're talking to them constantly. How often does the topic of their culture come up, establishing the culture? Um, so here, here's the, biggest non-secret in the world, every discussion I have. So the cadence is we have the, the day meeting where they're helping each other, where they bring what we call their issues. An issue can be an opportunity. It can be a challenge. Three fourths of the issues every time are about culture or talent and or talent. Every one-to-one -one, it's about culture. Talent and culture is in every one-to-one. -one. So I do a one hour monthly one-to-one -one with each of them, always about culture and talent are always on the agenda. It's the thing that they think about probably second place to how the cell pipeline is going. <laughs> right. Well, so when you're talking about talent, are you talking about succession or what kind of discussion is it about talent? Do you have the right people on the bus? So it's, it's, I think first topic one a, so it's a one a one B. So one a is, have we really analyzed our teams? And remember this is the CEO. Mm -hmm. And what they constantly tell me is I have, and you know, companies break in the middle. I have this director, you know, two levels down from me, got a bunch of C players. 
She won't swap them out. I keep telling her to, she's afraid to, cause she says somebody's bearing nobody. I don't know if I can replace them. And we finally get him to do it, you know, and she does it. And all of a sudden her world is amazing. And I, I tell right. people, one of my favorite quotes is, you know what makes a leader's life great? A great team. Yep. Go through the pain and top grade your team. So that's topic 1A all the time is top grade, top grade, top grade. Do we have, and by the way, it doesn't have to be all A players. We're fine with what I call professionals in place. B players are fine. You're not going to have a team. Anybody says, oh, all my people are A players. They're lying to you. No such thing. You don't want all A players because then everybody's fighting to be the, <laughs> the next a little, step. A little bit of that, right. <laughs> what you don't want is a bunch of C and D players. Though. And right. so that's a 1A. And then 1B is what I call the stunt double. Does okay. every leader have their stunt double picked out and developing them? Mm. Redundancy, redundancy, redundancy. If so-and-so leaves the company, who's who's next up this is the bill belichick genius right it, that for the patriots and i hate the patriots but i got to give him his due <laughs> they knew how to have next man up in that football team and yeah. that's the same thing we need in corporate America. It's the next the next person has to be ready the next person has to be ready who's the next person? you know hey mary who's your stunt double hey bill who's your stunt double let's get that next person ready to go yeah well you mentioned the patriots and we share a hatred for them but yes <laughs> Also, the you know, damn him. He he did it better than anybody managing the roster with people that he let them go too. When he yeah. knew they needed somebody at upgrade, let them go. Yep. And no, there was no nostalgia with, <laughs> with Bill Belichick. That's for sure. So you know my analogy. This is my this is really kind of silly analogy. So I in my organizational champion model, I talk about the first duty of an organizational champion is to the organization. So every first filter of a decision has to be, is this good for the organization? And then the okay. next filter is their team. And then the next filter is the individual th th themselves. And what I say is you have to think of yourself as the king of the jungle, queen of the jungle, right? So the queen of the jungle is out there. If you have a team of giraffes and there's a short neck giraffe, that short neck giraffe's got to go. There's a jungle out there with short trees. Let them go find it because you <laughs> need long neck giraffes. That's the okay. organization champion. <laughs> That's a great way to look at it. I've because as soon as you said that, I know, I know a couple short neck giraffes. <laughs> it, it's a tough thing to do. Well, uh, you say that your engagements with these CEOs, you know, they can be six months up to two years. I guess you're kind of, you know, ballparking. How do you well, know? No, that's if I do, if I did individual coaching. So okay. in the peer groups, they stay seven years. That's the average. Oh my gosh. And really? the only reason they leave is they sell their company or they retire. Wow. That, that's fantastic. I had no idea that it was yeah. that kind that's of, I mean, it's like a, like a legacy. I mean, it just keeps on going. It's how do you know that they're, they're ready to maybe they don't need your coaching anymore. How do you know that they're ready just to rely on peers? So the great news is we both know. So the one-to-ones start morphing into more conversations about life and just, you know, pondering the, the, the secrets of the universe. And I'm not joking. It's like really that kind of conversation Yeah, because they're getting everything they need in the group. The group has become the focus. So P I tell people all the time, you know, two, two things happen. CEOs sign up, humans show up. That's number one. Number two is they join for me, but they stay for the group. So they join because, you know, Hey, you know, we have a bond. We, we connect. All right. I'm going to just, you know, LK and I, we, we, there's a chemistry here. They get into the group and somewhere around two years, like I said, it's about a two year cycle. It's less about me and all about the group. And the longer they're there, it's more and more and more about the group, less and less and less about me. Now they love the fact that I'm a pretty decent facilitator, right? So I do get that and you know, I get that credit. But you know, like I said, after a while, I mean, we've covered every topic I have expertise on and mainly we'll just play what if, you know, that's what the one-to-one -one ends up becoming is a what if. They're talking about this. Well, what if we did that? Or what if we did this? Or what do you think of this? And just riffing, you know? Well, how do you advise right now? Because, you know, I, I, I sort of deviated from the topic, but you, you have a talent conversation. Culture is, you know, used to, I think culture got a lot of lip service before, maybe. I mean, I, I know culture is kind of a squishy term, but I think it became real obvious what your culture was when everybody went virtual. Yes. It was really hard to, you're like, oh my God, we're, I don't know what, what are my people doing or what they're feeling? How do, how do your CEOs, how did they find ways to battle that? 
So the teams that had really strong leaders, it, they didn't skip a beat. They pivoted, really? they figured it out, they moved on, they had good years. The teams that had not the leader, and typically not their direct reports, but the next level, they had really big issues. And I had two CEOs at the end of last year, at the end of you know the calendar year, call their leadership team in together and basically plant a new flag on the hill and say, look, this is this, I'm not debating what we're gonna be. Here's, I'm not happy with what we are. Hmm. Here's what we're gonna be. So you're either on board with me, we're not debating it, we're not, this isn't gonna be a consensus. I'm, I'm making a call. So either be with me or don't. And three of the seven leaders left because they didn't want to do the hard work. And what, what her thing was, was she said, I want bad news fast. Hmm. I, we're so afraid to say what's wrong. I'm, I'm so tired of being told everything's great, everything's good, and obviously it isn't. So I want bad news fast. That's, that's culture change number one. Culture change number two, we are going to become a sales driven company. I want you to hire, even when we hire operators, I want them with a sales acumen. I, I want to grow this company because we've been growing like this little inch by inch by inch thing. I'm tired of it. I want to grow big. Okay. And last, lastly, I'm dead serious now about getting rid of C players on our teams. And I'm going to, I am personally going to be holding you accountable for each layer in your area, you know, these leaders and if you don't change them, I will change you. And it works. That's, that's that has to be. That's usually where the buck stops. You hold the leaders accountable to keep their teams. I mean, you have to. And I don't know how every corporation is. I know mine runs lean. If you have one C player in a team, you're crippled. I mean, you, you can't really operate that way. Yep. Yeah. You have no redundancy, so you know it's just broken, right? It's just yeah. broken. And it's just amazing to me how long leaders will let someone be a non-performer and hang around. Oh, because we like them. Well, I, I like them too, but I don't want them on my business team. Right. You know, let's go. They can go play softball with me. <laughs> well, they got yeah. They only have three years to retirement. And we thought we'd. Let, I've I've heard that before too. Oh, like, yeah. Three years, man. <laughs> I mean, give me a give me a guarantee of three years. I love that. That sounds great. Uh, now you're a Naval Academy grad and yep. do you find that a lot of the, the same concepts of leadership you learned at Annapolis, are they integrated into what you teach right now? They have to be, I would think. Oh, totally are. You know, one of the things they do at the Naval Academy, the very first, they call it plebe summer, right? Where they just right. treat basically are their version of, you know, boot camp, and they make you rely on the other people. So like, for example, you're learning how to wear a uniform. You're learning how to, you have, your room has to be, so think about a college age kid and, and like they're inspecting whether your socks are folded exact way. They give you this manual about how your room has to look, where everything needs to be and how it's supposed to be folded. Literally how many inches your t-shirt is, all that. So they teach you this and they say, okay, room inspection tomorrow. And they come in and we don't know this at the time. Yeah. But they deliberately pick one room into the, you know, they can find something room with any, wrong with any room, right? They pick one room. Lucky me. It was our room. And they <laughs> say, you fail. And they tear your room up and throw everything in the hallway. And then they go into the other people's rooms and tear their stuff and throw it in the hallway and make us all pick our stuff up and do again inspection in three hours. And you're oh, doing it again. Once again, they go through, pick our room again. It's on purpose tear our room up. We failed. Now what happens is, you know, you don't know these people, right? These are kids from all over the country, literally. And we've just met doing, going through this thing together. And now they're mad at my roommates and me. There's three of us in a room. They're mad at us because we're screw ups. Everybody else right. is doing great and we're the screw ups. And so they go to be, they first they're mad. We're up all night having our room trashed. So it's like two 30 in the morning. And this, this started, at like eight in the morning the day before. So we've been doing the room, doing the room, doing the room. Now they, we did get to go to eat because they make you go eat, but we're doing this. Finally, it dawns on everybody. We need to help them. So now people are coming into our room and helping us do everything. 
So the firsties, the seniors, so the seniors lead the freshmen, right? The plebes, the firsties, that's when they say we pass. As soon as they see the other teams, other mids helping us do our room, that's the magic. And then they tell us the lesson. By the way, there was nothing wrong with their room. And we could have picked any room. We picked that one randomly. Lucky them. It's all about each other. That's leadership lesson number one. It's never going to be you. It's always going to be a team. That's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, you know, we have uh, a neighbor who's a good friend, their son. I believe he did his plebe summer last summer during COVID. So that was uh, an interesting thing as well. But uh, I know that, you know, leadership comes in all ways, shapes, and forms, but there's there's got to be a few places that teach it better than in the academy. So that's great. And right out of that, did you immediately get into entrepreneurship? No, not at all. I, I was really just, my, my career has been this hazard of luck, just yeah. random luck. So, you know, get out of the Marines. And I picked Navy Marines over the Navy for a very simple thing. Marines, you know, the officers eat last. And the officers in the enlisted all eat in the same place, the same crappy food off the same crappy utensils. And when you're in the field, the officer takes care of the Marine stuff first, then you take care of your stuff. It's that servant leader mentality. And I love that. So I get out of the Marines. I'm, you know, not sure what I want to do. You know, start going to grad school. Eh, not sure I want to do that. It was stupid because I was trying to be an engineer um, on a third shift at a Hallmark plant when, you know, printing gift wrap while I went to school during the day. That didn't work. So this guy I know knows the CEO of a company called American Wood Markup in Winchester, Virginia, and they'd locked into the home centers when the home centers had like, you know, and Home Depot had eight stores and they had grown like this and outgrown their own capacity. And they were going to hire the Boston Consulting Group to re-engineer the entire company so they could scale. And Bill Brandt wanted a Naval Academy because, you know, close to Annapolis, he wanted a Naval Academy grad to be the internal facilitator for them for P BCG. Okay. And I interviewed for it. We bonded. He gave it to me. So I spent the next four years function by function re-engineering the third biggest cabinet company in America. Oh, wow. And it was amazing. And Peter Senjay, who was the dean of the um, MIT Business School, wrote us up in the field book for the fifth discipline as a case study on learning organizations. And that led John Whelan Holmes in Atlanta to find me and said, I, hey, I want to hire you and do the same thing for my integrated building company. I want to win the National Housing Quality Award and be Builder of the Year. My picture on the cover of Builder Magazine. I want to do it in two years, not four years. So I said no, and then he bribed me, and I said yes, and <laughs> and we did it, right? And you know, I randomly was giving a speech on self-directed work teams. This is when Ronstadt was coming to the United States, and the yeah. CEO for North America, this big Dutch guy, Eric Bonk, comes up to me and says, "You must work for me. We're going to change everything in staffing in America." So I did. I didn't know anything about staffing. So I was like the third executive hired to go do that. And, uh, you know, we went from a hundred million to a billion in five years, then, then went and wasted some time at, wow. you know, that was a bad, that bad decision, but it worked out okay. Cause that's when I ended up doing the startup where I did a recruitment process outsourcing company inside of Spherion, a staffing company, um, that just rocked and ended up becoming source, right which then Ron Stodd bought, ironically. How about that? It all, it's like a, there's, there's a lot of synergy there. And, and I, would, I would argue that it's not really a random luck. I mean, we kind of, luck is made by those who are putting themselves in the right spot, taking advantage of opportunities, yet it knocked it out of the park when you probably don't get the, the next opportunity and so on. But one thing that's great though, um, I talked, I was actually on a podcast this morning being interviewed about pivotal moments in your career, things wow. that happen. And, you know, I can think of pivotal careers where I've learned some really hard lessons and I can think of things that, you know, stuck my neck out, took an opportunity and boy, things went great from that point on. And I mean, would you say what what is like that moment for you? I'm going to tell you. Really? Yeah, I'm going to tell you what. It was the wrong pivotal moment where, okay, I, great. Up, where I blew it. OK, so after. The startup went really well and we we scaled. We were, went from no revenue to 45 million in three years. And I did a deal with Accenture, the TSA. When TSA was being put together, we were the ones that did all the recruiting. And oh uh, we helped Accenture do that. And the CEO of Accenture's outsourcing business said to me, 
why are you doing this? This is the minor leagues. Come work for us. And I'll make you a partner. Let's do it. So I did. And it was awesome. The $100 million deals were the smallest we did. These, we did these massive global HR resets. It was really cool. Well, remember Eric Vonk, my Dutch friend? Yeah. So he yeah. left Ronstadt and went to be CEO at another company whose name I'm not going to name. And basically threw too much money at me for me to say no to leave Accenture. To gotcha. go to this other company that was broken and needed to be fixed. Dumbest decision I ever made. Just, wow. just did not go well. And, and I was out of there in a year. And you know, I look back and go, man, I gave up one of the greatest things I'd ever been doing with so much fun and doing these massive, interesting, fun deals, changing HR for these global companies. And then I went to that place and just didn't pan out. So my pivotal moment was that learning don't chase money. Yep. I had that, you know what? I had a similar experience. I got money whipped, took the opportunity and it just, and I knew going in, this is not going to be a fit for me, but you know, I did. And uh, even the mistakes, they teach you something and they direct you where you're going to go next, but that's a good one. And I, yeah. I, I have to give all due respect to Andrea Butcher. She's the one that posted this podcast and she'll kill me for stealing her question. But if you, uh, <laughs> If you had to give, um, you know, like life advice to people who are in HR that are thinking, you know, I can get to the top levels in HR, but I don't know that I can get to be a CEO. I mean, how, how many C, how many HR people actually get to be CEO? And I know there are some, but what is it you, you see? What is the, the life lesson or the, I don't know, the advice that you would give them? This is what you need to learn to be a CEO. Truly, deeply understand how the company makes money. Mm -hmm. and really understand the P&Ls. Mm -hmm. Do the little things like understand what a trailing 12 is, understand what rate of change means. You know, look at those things that HR typically doesn't look at. Understand the business. If you, you get deep in a business, and I, and I know it's hard because you have, you know, HR is really 12 functions, right? Or whatever number it is, but it's a whole bunch of functions kind of merged into one thing called HR. So yeah. there's so many things you have to pay attention to. There's so many balls in the air. So I get that it can be really hard, but I would deliberately schedule every week, not once a month, not once a quarter, every week I would schedule time in the business, learning how the business actually operates, how we actually make money and what, what are our, you know, you know, the classic SWAT, what are our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats for the business leaders? Well, and you, you probably have to be prompting those, you know, invites yourself too. Oh yeah. You've you got to push right? through. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a big part of it. And you know, if you're waiting for that, uh, that opportunity to come to you, it's probably going to pass you by because that's not your first choice normally. Correct. So tell me about when this thing launches and when we can, you said September that we're going to be able to day weekend. The, so they're okay. dividing the seasons are two seasons or two halves of a first season. I don't know how you want to call it. But so it starts Labor Day, five of the 10 teams over a five week period, the first episode Labor Day weekend, and then go to Earth Day 2022. I'm not even sure when Earth Day is, but it's the spring. I know that the next five teams will then have a season, right? Five episodes. So which season are you on? Do you know? I think I'm going to be season two because they're, I think they're just going to go by the number. We were randomly assigned numbers. I don't think there's any real thought to it. It's just like, okay, one through 10. And I think okay. you know, we're team eight. So I have a feeling we'll be the second season, which is fine. Hopefully the first season will build up some audience and we'll have a bigger audience. So do y'all vote people off other teams or give anybody a rose if they advance so, or anything like that? No. And what I really love about this is it was not, it's not about trying to have like a lot of reality shows like to have villains, right? Oh, this yeah. is, you know, they get, Hey, you're going to show up how you show up. Now let's be honest. I mean, the cameras don't lie. You, you know, you're going to show up, you show up, but they're not editing it to put people against each other or make one person look great and someone not look great. It's about the team coming together for that cause. And there's a lot of emotions in this because there's a, and I don't want to give it away. There's, there's a plot twist that happens halfway through the week that changes everything. Ooh. And it's super emotional. And I think it's going to um, really make people, you know, single tier kind of thing. It's pretty, it's pretty impactful. Wow. Well, I love a good teaser. That, that sounds good. <laughs> I think we've binged just about everything else that's available. So I'm actually looking forward to this. I'm, it, it's a, 
It's a catchy line, man. Four days to save the world. It's got a hook to it. That, that's for sure. It's got some stickiness. Yeah, I, it's this is a really amazing group of people. It's uh, it's one of the best things I've ever done. Well, I'm, I'm honored and just uh, thankful that you joined me today for a conversation. I know I don't send out questions beforehand or do anything like that. I just, I like to have conversations with interesting people and cool. you and I, we bump into each other on LinkedIn and stuff all the time. I think you post some great content. Thanks. Um, if people do want to connect with you or find out more about you, Larry, or you go by LK, I should tell uh, you. Know, honestly, have- I, I don't care either way. You know, okay. it's fine. Larry or LK. I, I, I say LK, but I don't, it's not like I really get upset about it or correct anybody. Um, you know, honestly, just come find me on LinkedIn. My okay, pronounce, there. pronounce your last name for everybody. Kill Stadius. So it's phonetic. It's a lot of letters. I get it, but it's phonetic. Kill Stadius. Just okay. I was going to go Kill Stadius, but Kill Stadius, I can do. There you go. All right. So we're, we're going to look for LK on LinkedIn and look ahead to look forward to seeing you on this four days to save the world. I can't wait to see it. Well, let's uh, after my episodes here. Let's let's talk again. I'd love yeah, to get, love to get your feedback. Yeah, because I'm gonna I'm gonna see. You mentioned you're wearing makeup too, so <laughs> yeah, you know, it's yeah. embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know you have uh, um, one of the pictures. I think it's on your LinkedIn profile. It's kind of got that blue steel effect from. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, I actually did that on purpose too. I was just thinking about that. Like I'm gonna look hard, like blue steel. <laughs> oh my God, that's, that's hilarious! Awesome. That's, that's great. Well, man, it's been a pleasure. Uh, best of luck to you. I, can't, I hope we can stay connected and talk again soon. I'm sure we will. Take care. All right, buddy. Bye. Take care.